In our lives, actions, and obligations, moral clarity matters. Given that the essence of moral thought is to address and ameliorate human suffering and to expand human freedoms, how can we afford not to attend to moral clarity when it comes to international relief and development? The Center for Values in International Development seeks to apply the insights, analytical frameworks, knowledge, and experience that already exist within the field of international development ethics to guide relief and development practice. We continue the dialogue with our second of five conversations with today's focus on inclusive development as part of the Center's Ethical Development Series Building an Effective Bridge Between the Practitioner's Community and the Ethicist's Community to the Mutual Benefit of Both and to the Significant Improvement in the Effectiveness of International Relief and Development. With me is Dr. Ravi Verma and Dr. Srin Kader. Srin holds the J. Newman Chair in Philosophy of Culture at Brooklyn College and is a professor of philosophy and women's and gender studies at the Cooney Graduate Center. Her most recent book, Decolonizing Universalism, a Transnational Feminist Ethic, asks what values should guide transnational feminist solidarity. And she is currently writing a book entitled The Freedom Myth about why we need to stop thinking feminism's core value is freedom and start thinking it's equality. Serene is joined by Ravi Verma, who is Asia Director of the International Center for Research on Women and leads local regional efforts on numerous issues, including reproductive health, family planning, preventing domestic violence and child marriage, engaging men and boys to empower women, and economic development. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the moderator and producer for this series of ethical discussions for the Center for Values in International Development. Thank you, Serene and Ravi, for participating in this discussion. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. I will be addressing questions to both of you, but this is a conversation, so feel free to address each other's comments. So without further ado, let's begin. How do you understand the term inclusive development, and why is development that is inclusive important for the practice of international development? Serene, could we begin with you? Thanks, Evan. Um, I'm so glad to be here with both you and Ravi. Um, I think a simple way of understanding inclusive development is uh, as development that um, allows um, every person in a society to equally participate in determining what counts as development and to benefit from um from the process of development. And one thing I think that's very important to understand about that is because I'm a philosopher, right? Equality, like when I say that everybody has an equal right to participate in um, designing development, thinking about what what counts as development and that they have an equal right to benefit is that um, equality is like what philosophers will call like a relational value. And so that means that, um, we can't like equality always has, like we're always comparing how two people are doing or how two groups of people are doing. So part of what that means, and you're going to hear a lot of versions of this, I think in my answers today, but is that, um, creating equitable or inclusive development does like is not always or only accomplished through making interventions in the lives of people who, um, are already disadvantaged, right? Sometimes the way to, um, give people who have been marginalized or disadvantaged access to defining development and access to the benefits of development is to change what people who are in advantaged groups are doing. Um, so I'm sure, I mean, Ravi's work is so much about this, but a simple example is that sometimes in order to change how, you know, whether women are like a part of inclusive development, one of the things we need to look at is what men are doing. And sometimes that is like an like a better way to bring about more inclusive development for women than um, just going straight to doing something for women in isolation. Um, Yeah, but big picture, I think um, inclusive development is giving everybody in the society the opportunity to participate in defining development and benefiting from it. And this contrasts with some earlier approaches to development that I'm sure people are familiar with, but for example, that that include assuming that economic growth um, just benefits everybody without looking at how it might actually produce increased inequality or leave some people out. It also contrasts with approaches to development that um, suggest that we already know what development is and what the goals of development should be. Um, instead, inclusive development says that 
people's own visions, including especially marginalized people's own visions of what a better life for them looks like, um, ought to play a role in shaping what development looks like. Thank you, Serene. And Ravi? Well, I thank you, Serene, for so nicely articulating this idea of inclusive development. I couldn't agree with you more that it is <clears throat> oftentimes not only about um, marginalized communities, it is about uh, larger structures and, and the fact that the structures do ensure equity in the process of inclusive development. It should not be uh, a, a rhetoric where only uh, people uh, identified and labeled as someone who, who needs to be included in development as a matter of top-down uh, uh, ideas or, or, or the package of uh, inclusion. Uh, it is something that needs to be owned up by by everyone and all those who who have been on the margins of uh, development. So, so it is primarily, in my view, creating opportunities, ensuring uh, that there is uh, access and ensuring that this entire process is owned by, by those who who have remained on the margins. So equity, social justice clearly defines the idea of inclusive development. Thank you both. Moving on to the next question. When setting development policy and programming priorities, people and groups who are marginalized and vulnerable have little or no voice. How can the voices and the humanity of the marginalized and vulnerable be elevated, understood, and responded to? Well, this is uh, a, quite a struggle uh, to, uh, to engage and, and, and hear the voices and the concerns of communities and people who are marginalized. Uh, the methodology that we have, the the tools that we use in the development uh, paradigms often do not really permit us to um, to shift that ownership. And I think we have always been hearing and we have been practicing in some ways to to ensure that uh, they the communities become part of the process of thinking through their own priorities and and having their own concerns expressed in, in the process. But somewhere down the line, we often find that the solutions, solutions within the courts are predetermined, predisposed. You know, there is, there is um, always, uh, and, and I think it relates to the fact that uh, the participation of those voices are always in conflict with those who have the dominant voices and and the uh, the ones who have a much greater stakes in the maintenance of status quo and as a result um, the if the ownership and the participation of those voices have to become the uh, major paradigm of this uh, uh, development then there has to be a genuine soul searching by those who think that they are uh, in uh, command of developing others. I mean, that's that itself is is uh, very presumptive that I I am the one who can develop you, and I think uh, the uh, and that's where the power equation just gets set in in the process. So my so I'm. I'm just simply reflecting on this entire issue of representing their voices is easily said than done unless we recognize those vested interests and the unwritten, hidden uh, kind of agenda of the development uh, and are made explicit. So that's why ethics and transparency and accountabilities are an important part of ensuring voices. Uh, and, and it's not it's not done in short-term project mode. It is done as long-term commitment to these issues. I love what you said, Ravi, and I was just wondering if maybe, do you want to give an example of the type of thing that you're talking about? Because I think the audience might really benefit from hearing an example. 
the thing that is very clear to me is the is the set of programs that go on the name of um, health, especially within the sector of health, and how health is defined is is so medicalized and and technical and jargonized that it has still it it and it is technocratic a large part of it and it benefits the powerful groups of those who are benefiting from having a larger health agenda which is downstream oriented and and we have we have not yet seen within the health sector a genuine reflection of gender um, issues gender and health has truly not come together um, or, or, or the health sector has not really imbibed the uh, the gender framework in a mainstream manner and i'll give you an example of how during the covid time we have been tracking the sex uh, disaggregated data from 197 countries for last about one and a half year and countries after countries we have seen that they have they have not presented the data sex disaggregated data on the spectrum of COVID um, uh, uh, inf infection, right from the identification of cases to the to the hospitalization to deaths to vaccinations, there are very few countries, and I'm using the word sex very deliberately because whatever data if you whatever data we have on uh, on this <coughs> sex disaggregated, if you look at that data within different context, <coughs> you find that. Uh, sometimes women are more more women are infected than men, and sometimes you find more men are infected than women, depending on how the the roles and the patriarchy no, patriarchal norms gets get uh, played out in those contexts. Who becomes vulnerable for what reasons? But in the absence of that, even the basic biological information about se sex disaggregation does not allow us to interpret the gender dynamics of how the other drivers are marginalizing or accentuating the vulnerabilities to both women, men and women in, and other gender and forget about the other genders there's no other there's no data by other other uh, you know uh, aspects on on the gender spectrum it's just men and women itself we don't get data uh, disaggregated disaggregated by this yeah, I think that was extremely helpful. Thank you. My answer is very in line with Ravi's um, about kind of like when Ravi mentioned the importance of soul searching on the part of um, people who could conceive themselves as the developers, right? Like I was going to initially answer by saying this question makes me grumpy a little bit. The question that says like the marginalized have no voice. I'm like, well, this is like... Uh, it's grumpy because it's like, well, do they have no voice or are people not listening to them? Because I think it's very easy and, you know, kind of with what I was saying about relationships before, like maybe we could say like really having a voice, it partly means being able to analyze your situation for yourself and being able to speak out. But it also means that other people are taking up your voice. And so, you know, we have had now, I mean, 60 or some years of criticism of mainstream development of people saying that part like the participation of local people is not taken seriously. So I think it's a little bit, not to say that there are no people who are voiceless, but it is a little bit strange to say that the problem is only that marginalized people don't have a voice. Like the problem is often a lack of uptake on behalf of people, even I think in this generation who think that they are advocates of participatory development, right? Like they know to say that word, but like, what does it really mean to listen? And I think part of the soul searching that we need to see is, well, like what are the disconnects that are allowing practitioners to say that they are advocates of participatory development, but still not really be listening. And I think there's a lot of kind of different things we could point to there. Um, one that I think Ravi already pointed to is technocracy and like the idea of expertise, like especially like when we're watching, like we're in this era of development where we're watching lots of technocratic um, 
development actors kind of enter the scene and say, I have this technology, like, let's figure out how I'm going to make it work for these people. I'm going to have a a meeting with them (laughs) and like, look, that's participatory development. When, I mean, as Ravi said, like one meeting is not going to, um, you know, this happens in a long time horizon of partnership and it's and you know one meeting may actually represent the interests of the more dominant people in the community one meeting i mean may happen under circumstances where the supposed beneficiary population is really afraid of losing access to the resources so they'll say anything in order to retain access to the resources but also like the other part of technocracy is like this whole framework that says i have this particular technology to deliver to you well that already assumes that the priorities of this development project are set so i would say kind of technocracy and short term pro- pro- like project based interventions and also the idea that like a single meeting constitutes participation all of those um are things that get in the way I'd also just say that it's we need to think about participation um, much more broad and the voice of the poor or the voice of the marginalized as including much more than just what um, people say in the context of meetings about how they should respond to a particular intervention. So I think there's an obvious place that we should be looking for like the voices of the marginalized that development practitioners often forget about, which is social movements that are led by marginalized people. So I think it's really easy to say like participation just looks like what's happening in this meeting when we're deciding what to do about this like laser pointer intervention X or Y. But there are lots of other ways that marginalized people are communicating, you know, what they care about and what their development priorities are. Um, But that means that you have to like look outside of like the community meeting in order to find out what they are. Right. So one kind of example that I think of about social movements around this is like the frequency with which indigenous people's movements are saying that they want something different from what development organizations are giving them. And like, they're not always saying that necessarily I mean, some of them are, of course, like in the meeting with the organization, but we also know, for example, like um, that, you know, they're often saying that environmental degradation is like a cost that they don't want to bear. But you have to maybe look at what the social movements are saying in order to say that. Like, I think of this documentary called In the Name of Lithium about um, indigenous people in Argentina that basically says like, well, the social movement is saying we don't want lithium mining here because we don't want to destroy our aquifers. Like you might not ever know that this is a a priority if you were just like, well, how are we going to make this lithium mining up? We have brought you (laughs) this good of lithium mining. Let's talk about how to make it work together. Like if that's your only framing and social movements aren't a part of the picture, you might actually miss some of the deeper things that communities are saying about what they want. There is a scarcity everywhere of reliable and comprehensive empirical data about the plight of the marginalized and the vulnerable. What can be done about this gap? Serene, what are your thoughts? I think that there are two very straightforward things that could be done here. One is just that there needs to be much more funding for um, the creation of um, expertise, like academic and technical expertise um, among people in the global South. And I think that means um, heavily funding think tanks, universities, um, academic research within the global South. Um, And also, I think equally importantly, um, funding um, the ability of this um, research to be disseminated within the global North, because of course we have this really big problem that, um, this is less of the, the case in India, for example, but, you know, people are writing in languages other than English um, or they're writing in journals that are not accessible in the North or that nobody in the North reads. So we need not just to be providing a lot of funding for um, fostering expertise among scholars in the South, um, but we also need to be 
funding the institutions that allow the dissemination of information that's created in the South to flow to people in the global North. Like, because, and this also goes to the issue of whether, you know, people in the global South already have a voice. Like, well, there is actually, there's certainly not enough funding for um, universities, think tanks, academic institutions, but it is, people are creating knowledge sometimes. And then that knowledge is not actually effectively making it into the hands of people whose um, practices it could transform. So I think part of the story here is that we, like a huge development priority should be putting money into um, universities, think tanks and such in the global South, including ones that would um, enable people to speak back to d- dominant development discourses. Um, another kind of quick thing that I think is important um, is for, since this podcast is really aimed at practitioners, for people who are um, engaged in project-based interventions to be um, seeking and funding um long-term external um, evaluations of the work that they're doing. So I think, I mean, one of the real problems that we see in this field is that so much of the research about project effectiveness is conducted by donors and often by the people who um, implemented the project themselves. And this is worrisome for a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that it's, you know, it's unlikely that you are going to get honest feedback about the downsides of a program um, if you are the person who has implemented it. Even if you get the feedback, to go back to an earlier point, you might not even be able to really take the negative feedback in because you are so invested in your perception of yourself as helping these people. But you might not even get the negative feedback, especially because, and I think this is a really important point, um, People are afraid of losing the relationships or the resources um, that come from the intervention. So um, there's this, it's a little bit old now, I think it's from like the late 1990s or the early 2000s, but there's a set of reports that I really like by the anthropologist Mark Fiedrich about um, action aids reflect programs. So, you know, like a very like free Aryan, non-traditional type of development program. And what he finds about even that program is that, um, you know, people are valuing the relationship with the development practitioner and the social capital it gives them in their community more than the actual product that the intervention is giving them. But how, I mean, so I think one thing we can take away from that that's really important to understand is we need methods for collecting data um, that um, separate the interests of the like, keeping the relationship with the development practitioner from um, actually gathering the information. Um, yeah, and then, of course, um, I think it's important for research to always include methodologies where marginalized people participate in framing the questions that the research is asking and where um, they, where once the research has been created, they are asked for feedback about whether this research actually represents um, how they see the issue. Thank you, Serene. And Ravi, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, well, I echo everything that Serene has said. Um, I, also think that there is it's a very paradoxical situation in fact on data on one hand we have huge surveys quantitative surveys ha- happen at the national level and but we don't get subnational data and that on a regular continuous basis so one there is there's a clear need for creating uh, means and resources to gather subnational data uh, to allow a much greater disaggregation, which I was referring to in, in an earlier point. So, so that's one part of the story where we need uh, consistent, high quality, subnational, disaggregated kind of uh, data that can be uh, used not only by the experts, by by others for whom the data is meant for. So uh, getting that data and also making it less um, unwieldy is is important aspect of data generation and data use. 
the other side of the story is that <clears throat> is is something that relates to your earlier question of participation of people and their voices and i think a lot of participatory work that happens or the qualitative so called qualitative kind of work that happens on the ground they are very uh, they are the kind of neo positivist they are reconfirming what you already know it's kind of reaffirming yourself revalidating what you want to do rather than disrupting the uh, the system and the structures so my sense is that on on the issue of data who is gathering data for what purpose is very critical is, is critical part of the story you know we we always will find funds if there are vested interests to gather some kind of data at, at many levels but the data that is needed by the communities for their own use and for informing their own cases that they can advocate for in, you know uh, in every aspects of life with the disruption that is happening through climatic and environmental changes or their own areas being uh, they are being displaced uh, of or the farms or the or the lands being taken away those data you don't get coming from the from the people from the people and and the uh, and the communities does pursuing inclusive development require us to seek more radical change to the distribution of power such that equality and universal human dignity become more than just rhetorical concepts serene could we start with you i I think the short answer to this is yes. I think, um, like I was saying earlier, one of the important things about concepts like equality and equity is that they're relational concepts. Like the only way that we are going to achieve equality because it's a certain kind of relationship between people is not just by working on people at the bottom. We have to work on people at the top, right? Like part of why, and I take this to be part of Ravi's point about this permanent state of marginalization like part of the reason that people at the bottom are at the bottom is because of the advantages disproportionately accruing to people at the top. So we have this really bad habit in development circles of acting like, oh, if we can, we just work on people in the bottom, like, you know, they get income, they get skills or something like then um, society will be transformed. But that's not necessarily true for a few different reasons. One reason is just that um, the um, part of the reason people at the bottom are stuck at the bottom is sometimes the behavior of people at the top, right? Like, I mean, it's not a coincidence that, I mean, just to give, you know, an example from development, I mean, we live in this world where we think that like, you know, our model, this is a little bit of a cynical way of looking at it, but our model for women's empowerment is mostly like, oh, if we can just get enough women making handicrafts, like that people in the global north are going to buy and keep in their houses, like that is the way that we're going to solve global poverty. But it's like, but what about the bigger picture where our actual vision for what the world looks like is where some people are like the majority of the world's people are going to live off providing occasional handicrafts for the very small percentage of people at the top. Like this isn't a solution. Like we have to get rid, like we talk about getting rid of extreme poverty and we don't talk about getting rid of extreme wealth. Like the second um, sort of reason that I think we have to talk about the relationship between the people on the top and the people at the bottom is not just that people at the top are preventing the people at the bottom from um, getting, um, you know, being actually included into the benefits of development, but also that at the end of the day, if you have a lack of equality between people at the top and people at the bottom, like if that relationship is extreme enough, it's always going to produce domination of people at the bottom, right? So we can raise the floor of the poor. And I'm not saying that's not a bad, like a good thing to do. Like, of course, we want people to have their basic needs met. But if the gap between the global rich and the global poor, or even the rich in within the global South and the poor within the global South um, remains as big as it is, well, we can expect the people at the top to continue dominating society and dominating political processes. Like, 
just the gap will do that. It doesn't just like, it doesn't matter if the people at the bottom have their basic needs met. If some people just have so much more than others, it's hard to imagine equitable political institutions in that kind of situation. Thank you, Serene and Ravi. You know, I, I, I think there is a need, uh, and that's what we have been discussing all through in response to all the five questions that you asked before this, that there is a need for a paradigm shift. I think there is. And and what does this paradigm shift look like? It, to me, it, I think it is from coming from global south country and working within in the communities that have uh, such heavy, huge deprivations or l- lack of access to some of the basic stuff. Um, the, the, the very first uh, point should be to enhance the access. You know, we don't have schools that are accessible to the girls. They need, they, there are no ro- roads, there are no transportation facilities for 15 to 20 miles uh, to go walking or, or the cycles that are given to the girls they are used by the men or the fathers because they don't have any other access uh, to enhance their mobilities. So uh, access really gives, uh, you know, it, it promotes uh, opportunities and opportunities give rise to the agencies or the voices. The voices don't come in the first place because when we say that they should ask for and they should participate. That's what we are saying. Does not um, does not just come on its own. Uh, the agencies come only after they have access and they have the opportunities and they begin to see themselves as an asset, not not asset by someone who is in a powerful position to use them for some purposes. But the but the uh, people begin to see themselves as an asset and 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 work towards uh, that. And we have seen in programs of livelihood and employability kind of a program that we do at a small scale that that uh, the dire need the desperate need uh, to move in in that direction by the girls adolescent girls late adolescent girls who are fearing that if they don't get into uh, into a work stream they would soon be married off yeah, so uh, till but then how do they do it do this unless we shift completely from it, uh, from a perspective of enhancing act first, ensuring that they have access to the resources in some ways, and 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 create those opportunities for them to uh, to widen their uh, their you know networking and resource uh, uh, access to resources which they can use for themselves in to fulfill their aspirations, and that's where the agencies and voices then begin to shape. So I I, I think. Um, a lot of it is is about how structures. Again, I'm saying these are structural issues, and very often, a um, lot of the programs that focus uh, on uh, participatory or taking people's voices into the uh, into the programs or work only on norms, which again put the responsibilities onto the individuals. They uh, they they clearly miss out the fact that uh, we are not uh, holding a larger policy and structural determinants of marginalization that are uh, that are not giving them even basic access so uh, it, and that's where i think it's a it's a struggle as, um, as uh, within the pa- uh, development uh, paradigm we must uh, have programs we must have uh, uh, the interventions that are disruptive in nature how often do we really disrupt I mean, we are always always smoothening the uh, contours, you know, uh, in every uh, which way. So, uh, so nobody wants to push uh, the others into a zone of discomfort or boundaries of comfort is never pushed and out, pushed. And and as a result, uh, even the programs on norms, programs on economic empowerments, engaging men and boys, they don't. They are least disruptive. You know, the languages have been co-opted of gender transformative programming and gender transformative, um, uh, you know, uh, frameworks. But but um, rarely do we see that these programs or these ideas. Uh, 
As we come to the conclusion of the conversation, could you please share any closing thoughts with the audience that may emphasize certain ideas and concepts previously discussed or that we have yet to touch? Please. That we need to have a gender lens that acknowledges that the men in those societies are often also victims of other type of marginalization. Like, so we need to look at men as usually beneficiaries of elements of the gender system, but we also need to understand that the reasons that men may be feeding into those parts of the gender system um, are um, genuine vulnerabilities that they have because of issues like poverty and caste and so on. Thank you, Serene. Please, Ravi. One point that I have always kept in my mind when I engage in some of these programs that I work with and the communities is that uh, to ensure that we see uh, the disruptive and, and power of the development, not in a destructive manner, but in a manner that allows the points of introspections and confrontation in self-critical mode at every level. So how much of the critique these programs can generate is what we need to do as development practitioners. Uh, we, uh, I, 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 I also think that data, data is the most powerful tool to create that disruption and, and uh, dissonance. And therefore, development practitioners have a responsibility to generate the data responsibly with sense of accountability and uh, with a sense of making sure that the data is uh, used by the people for whom they are meant for. And I, I think uh, we need to be our theoretical sometime, not very, very often, a lot of the time, many development programs begin with a theoretical premise and theoretical framework, which is good, but, uh, but but we forget in the process of fulfilling or adhering or testing out those hypotheses that we have begun with, drawing from many other uh, literature and, and the uh, theories that there are, uh, that story, uh, the life unfolds differently in different contexts. And what needs to be done in, um, uh, in development uh, programs is to understand how life is unfolding and in its unnest, you know, to understand w what it means to the people and capture that process of, um, of lived experiences of people and then try to situate development response into those lived experiences without being, without uh, disrupting them from their own uh, places. I think a lot of a lot of development programs have literally moved people from uh, one place to another. The, the displacement, migrations, and forced um, which uh, mobility uh, is again not very helpful in uh, you know in meeting the kind of outcomes that we are looking at. And that's what I said. That keep in mind that we are constantly either feeding into a humanitarian crisis or we are responding to them in a manner but we don't recognize that. So I'll just, my takeaways from, from this conversation is this. Thank you. I want to thank you on behalf of the Center for Values and International Development for your time and sharing your unique perspectives. <laughs> thank you to you, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Serene, for such a pleasure. This concludes the second of five conversations sponsored by the Center for Values and International Development. In addition to our first conversation, Introducing Development Ethics, we will also be exploring topics on democratic values, climate justice, and empowerment, all with the goal of strengthening the relationship between development practitioners and ethicists, because moral clarity matters. <laughs>